A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Okay, so let's have some quick review. We have been looking at principles of church government, and so far we have, a, we have um, gone through four of them. So go ahead and get your notes out. This is not a closed book test. This is an open book test. <laughs> Y'all remember those? I hated open book tests. They were so hard, right? Worst final I ever had in college was the prof said, number one, come up with five good questions for this course. <laughs> and number two, answer three of them and you will be graded whether you answered the hard ones or the easy ones. <laughs> What a horrible final that was. Okay, principle number one of church government from the scripture is? Go ahead and look at your notes. What is number one? Officers are elected by the people. Thank you very much. Officers. Okay, number two. Overseer equals elder. And another name for overseer is bishop. Okay, another name for elder is? Presbyter. Presbyter. Okay, and there's one more here on the, for the third for the equal sign. The same people that are bishops, our elders are? pastors or shepherds. Right? It's the same Greek word for pastor and shepherd. After all, where do the sheep eat? In the pasture. Right? Okay, same root, right? Okay, so the same person who is a bishop or an overseer, bishop is the old translation, and remember the King James is involved in the whole Anglican movement. Data King James 1611, Anglican movement begins with Henry VIII. Oh, around 1630s, somewhere in there, 1620s and 30s. Okay, so a bishop, same person as an elder. We saw that in scripture, is the same person as a pastor, as a shepherd. Okay, principle number three. More than one elder. Plurality of elders, right? Okay, very good. Some churches have in the former government, good solid Presbyterian churches, you cannot exist if you don't have at least two elders. Typically the pastor is one of those elders, one we call the pastor. Okay, number five, or number four rather. Ordination was the act of plurality of elders. Right, ordination. Is the act of a, of a group of elders, right? The plurality. Now, take out your copy of that section of the um, Council of Trent that you have, and let's take a look at some of these, you know, as part of our review. Um, and we have been concentrating on Canons 6, 7, 8. Everybody have their copy of the Council of Trent? Anybody, let's put it this way, anybody not have a copy? I see that hand, brother. There you go, thank you. I can only go so far, I'm tethered. There you go. Oh, oh, Steve's bringing it over to you. There's an extra one for you guys. Okay. So look at um, Canon 6, 7, and 8. We've been looking at primarily at 6, a little bit at 8. But Canon 6 is, if anyone says that the, in the Catholic Church there's not a hierarchy by divine or, ordination instituted consisting of bishops, priests, and ministers, if anybody says that there isn't a hierarchy there, right? Remember how we described the, the uh, prelacy form of government was a pyramid with less and less people at the top. 
That's important, you'll see, okay? So let him be anathema. So that's contrary to number two, right? This is we saw in the scriptures in Acts 20, in Titus chapter 1. Okay, this is a principle from scripture. But if you don't agree with their principle, what does it mean? Let them be anathema. What does that mean? Make them go to hell. Let's be, let's be blunt. That's what it means. Okay? okay. What English word or actually Greek word do we get from anathema? Maranatha. Okay, so when you name your child Maranatha, you may want to think that through again. I'm serious, 1 Corinthians 16, okay? Yeah, Mar yeah, Maranatha means Lord come quickly, but the context is come quickly in judgment. Okay, yeah, look, 1 Corinthians 16 is where it is, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a shocking thing, isn't it? Maranatha Christian schools, I've seen that all over the place, things like that, okay. Canon number eight, if anyone says that the bishops who are assumed by authority, assumed means what? Doesn't mean, assume, our, in our language has a meaning, but that's different. Assumed by authority of the Roman pontiff. In other words, become bishops because of the authority of the Roman pontiff. The Roman pontiff is the Pope. Are not legitimate and true bishops, but a human figment. Let him be anathema, okay? And let's go up to number seven then, which we haven't really looked at. Let's just read it. If anyone says that bishops are not superior to priests, notice the language, superior to priests. It assumes the whole hierarchical structure of prelacy. That they have not the power of confirming or ordaining that the power that they possess is common to them and to priests, or that or conferred by them without the consent or vocation of the people. Whoops! Somebody is ordained without the what? Consent of the people, does that remind you of number one? Okay, this came out of Acts and other places, right? Okay, okay. Let the consent or vocation, what does vocation there mean? The calling. Okay, vocatio is the Latin term. Okay, so the calling. Okay, so for the... <clears throat> Okay. Conferred by them without the consent or vocation of the people or of the secular power. What is that? What is the secular power? That means the civil government has the authority to put in church officers. You like that idea? You wouldn't really make very good English subject. Now they're not English citizens, they're subjects, aren't they, over there? Okay? We're going to look at, in a, a little bit, maybe today, maybe next time, the original Westminster Confession had a section on that, and it said that the civil government has the right to control church officers. Hmm. Who's the head of the church in England? The queen. The queen. Yeah, the queen. Okay. Hmm. I don't like that idea. I don't think the Lord... What? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, you know why Mary asked that? Why, what about the Church of Scotland? As soon as the Queen crosses the border into Scotland, she's no longer a member of the Anglican Church, she's now a member of the Church of Scotland. And the Church of Scotland has what form of government? Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Isn't that interesting? Okay, in the historic Presbyterianism, which is what we're looking at, the head of the Church is the Lord Jesus Christ alone. We're gonna to get to that. That's gonna be point number six from biblical principles, okay? So what happens then? Yeah, so I guess she's no longer the head of the church over there in Scotland, huh? But she goes, she crosses back, you know, in England, she's now the head of the church, okay? So, okay, let's go on. Um, by the way, there's a term for that, the civil government does it, it's called Erastianism. So put that down, you know, write it down great kind of thing to talk about at cocktail parties. What do you think of Erastianism? Do you think we ought to have that? And they're gonna say, well, what is that? And you'll sound so erudite and educated <laughs> as you're dropping that language around. Okay, so, <clears throat> so let's start this again. If anyone says that bishops are not superior to priests or that they have not the power of confirming or ordaining or that the power which they possess is common to them and to priests, in other words, a leveling of the bishops and the priests, or that orders confirmed by them without the consent or vocation of the people or of the secular power are invalid, 
or that those who have neither been rightly ordained nor sent by ecclesiastical and canonical power, but come from elsewhere, are lawful ministers of the word and of the sacraments, let him be anathema. So if you don't agree with them, in other words, if you're not an Erastian, okay, or if, I'm sorry, if you are an Erastian, let him be anathema. Okay, any questions on that review? What is the date of the Council of Trent? Yeah, about 1560s and 70s in that period. So it's just after Luther and Calvin, okay, written in, in, in reaction to Luther and Calvin, okay? So there's a quick review for what we've seen. We are at the bottom of page six in our study sheets. Everybody have a page six? Okay. I don't have a page six either, <laughs> except for my notes. I can make some. Can you make some? Who's got a blank page six? Anybody got a blank one? Yeah. I'm sorry. It's my fault. Chad, thank you for bailing me out. Okay. This is really the opposite of doing everything decently in order, isn't it? <laughs> My goodness, Garrison, get organized. Okay, so let, we're looking at um, 1 Timothy 5.17. That's at the bottom of page 6. Or page 7, I'm sorry. Bottom of page 7. Is that right? Uh, no, no, yeah. Yeah, there is. Yeah, it's, <laughs> Diane, I need some more coffee. Here, Mark, hand these out, would you? Thank you. Okay, now page seven at the bottom. We're looking at 1 Timothy 5.17. Now, why are we spending time on 1 Timothy 5.17? We're spending time on 1 Timothy 5.17 because that is the classic verse used to prove the three office position. Okay. So what is the three office position? The three office position is that you have ministers and elders and deacons. Okay. Now, what I'm trying to teach here in the class is that that distinction in the first two is unbiblical. I'm being blunt. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just not real good at smooth and suave. Okay, but what I'm trying to show to you that this distinction is not in Scripture. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at 1 Timothy 5.17. And we, last time we drew a big circle. Okay, there's the session. Who is the session? The elders. Do you remember why they're called the session? What is the word? What? They sit. They sit. The word session means those who sit, okay? Where was Christ right now? He's at the right hand of the Father, and what's his posture? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. The only time he's talked about him when he's not sitting at the right hand of the Father is where? Do you know? Yeah, Stephen, Stephen's, um, the story of Stephen. There he says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Okay. So the session is what we call our board of elders. In the continental churches, it's called the consistory, okay? And so Paul says here in 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders who rule well, let me turn over, there, be worthy of double honor, or be given double honor, right? Be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. So we have over here elders who rule well, and what do we have over here? Not rule well, right? So we can either say rule well and put a circle with a line across it, <laughs> right? That's kind of confusing. So let's just say not rule well, okay? Real simple, we understand that? Some elders rule well, some don't. So let the elders who rule well be worthy of double honor, 
But then there's another statement in the sentence. What is it? Especially those who labor in yeah, word and doctrine. Okay, so we have a subgroup of those who rule well, and these labor in word and doctrine. Now, could you have some over here who not rule well who also labor in word and doctrine? Sure you could, right? You could, okay? But here's the point. What is the difference between this group, we're going to call it 1A, and this group we're going to call 1B? Do they rule well? What's the difference? One gets paid by the church and one does not. They labor. Now, technically, and yes, some ministers get offended by this, but this is still what the scriptures teach, these guys over here don't have a job. We say to them, don't have a job. Instead, we will take care of you and your family financially. Salary, benefits, you know, pension plan, the whole thing. That's the difference. We don't say that to these guys. We do say that to these guys. That's all it says. Okay. So which one of these is 1A or 1B are elders? Both are elders. How about these guys over here, group two? Are they elders? Yes. yes. Okay. Now, you see, that's all it says. That's all it says. In other words, again, in my smooth and suave, okay, we got a couple elders sitting over there. Got one sitting right here, right? We have not said to these brothers, we have not said, don't have a job, we'll take care of you financially. We have not said that to them. We have said that to Pastor Chad, Pastor Bobby, right? Any questions on that? Uh, yeah, Phil. Not a question, but at the risk of being permanently banished from the class, <laughs> <laughs> I would still like to vote for non-biblical rather than unbiblical. Yeah, the, your language. And you're basically not disagreeing with the concept here. You're saying, John, tune up your language a little bit. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mark. Repeat the question. <laughs> Phil said that, th that the concern is it's too easy to, to make synonymous unbiblical and non-biblical. That's your concern. Yeah. And that we ought to make that because unbiblical is much stronger terminology. If we were going to something like Right. Okay. In non-biblical, you're trying to say is something not as serious. Okay. But unbiblical, it approaches and includes heresy. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. That's fine. Good. Thank you. Okay. So you're not arguing for the three office view. You're just saying, you're just saying, tune up your language a little bit. Good. Okay. Fine. Yes. Kathy. Yeah, when he quotes it, yeah. Okay, so let's go on. Thank you, Mark. With the <laughs> Do I have a good grandson? <laughs> Mark holds up to repeat the question sign. The question was, Kathy said she liked my argument about the ox getting fed. So let's look at the ox getting fed. Okay, because we're asking the question, what does it mean to get double honor? Okay, so let's go on. Verse 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. For the scripture says, now when you have that term for, it means because. Because the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads on the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Now, what is the statement about you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain? That's talking about when you would have the grain in the middle and you have this device with, with a big stone on it with a piece of wood that would come out hooked to the yoke around the ox and, and the ox would go around and around and around but in the middle would be the grain. Now how does the ox get paid? He gets to have a bite whenever he wants one. You don't put a muzzle on the ox, you let him eat. Okay? And Paul quotes that and says, what well, I think it's in the 2nd Corinthians, is God concerned about oxen? Of course not. 
Okay, to, to make the distinction there, we're supposed to pay our pastors. And Paul here again uses the same thing about we should pay our elders. So, so these people up here that rule well, but we don't labor in word and doctrine, it's legitimate to pay them, but then they would fall down into this category, wouldn't they? Okay. But Paul's argument that these guys should receive honor, double honor, among other things, comes from the scripture there. But you don't muzzle the ox, and the labor is worthy of his hire. Now, <clears throat> let's go back into our three office view, because as I have said, the three office view is the predominant view. Okay? And you have a ruling elder over here. Thank you, Chad. Over here. And we decide to pay him. Can we do that? Can we decide to pay our ruling elders? Yes or no? Yes. Why not? I know of churches that have done it. Okay? Okay? I knew a guy that was a, a naval officer, San Diego, a lot of Navy people, got out of the Navy, and he was a ruling elder, and they wanted to use him because he was so talented in the church. Okay? So if he is a ruling elder, we're using three office language, and we decide to pay him, where does he go? He goes down into this category, right? Does that mean he's now a minister? Not according to the three office view, but according to scripture, he, if, if you go back to the point where bishops equal, equal elders equal pastors, but he was, a, he was a bishop up here, wasn't he? You see my point? He's an unpaid bishop here. He's a paid bishop here. He's an unpaid elder here. He's a paid elder here. He's an unpaid pastor here. He's a paid pastor here. The only difference is some we pay, some we don't. And I don't even like the word pay because that implies a job, and he doesn't have a job. We say to him, don't have a job. Now, the language typically in OPC calls, I don't know about ARP, is that, that you may be free from worldly care and avocation. We promise to pay you whatever, so much per year or so much per month and, you know, semi-monthly payments, blah, 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 that kind of language. Notice that language that you might be free from worldly care and avocation. What does that mean? So you don't have a job. Okay. Any questions on that? Well, you see the next point then on the handouts is let's go to Acts, the book of Acts. Now, why are we going to the book of Acts and look at this particular chapter 18, verses 8 and 17? And that is one of the arguments used against the two office view and in favor of the three office view is this. In the synagogue, they had these people that they called elders, and they didn't teach in the synagogue. They were like ruling elders. You know, ruling elders, back in the three office view, if you assume the three office model, which I don't assume, but if you assume the three office model, your ruling elder does what? He rules. Okay, doesn't have to teach. He comes to session meetings and he rules. Okay, that's the strict, radical three office view. Okay. And they want to use the synagogue as the model. But I want you to look at 1 Corinthians, or I'm sorry, Acts 18. Paul is at Corinth and he's preaching the gospel in Acts 18. Okay. So in verse 1, the thing, Paul, the things Paul departed from Athens goes down to Corinth. Remember your geography? Corinth is just south of Athens a little bit. He found a certain Jew there named Aquila, etc. Down to verse 5. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and t testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him, verse 6, and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on I'll go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now, Crispus is called the ruler of the synagogue. Is that word ruler in the singular or the plural? Singular is not a true question. That means there's how many rulers in the synagogue? Okay, very good. Go down to verse 17. 
Paul is before the judgment seat, okay, and others, and they're accusing Paul. <clears throat> By the way, this is the, the term is Bema. You all heard of the Bema judgment? Some people like to make a big deal about that, okay? This is the Bema, the judgment seat. I have been there. Very interesting. They have, it, it, the archaeologists have, have dug all of this out. So he, drew, so he his, is <clears throat> the Roman ruler here, okay? And he throws him out. His name's Gallio, verse 12. And he drives him from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks take Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue. Is that in the singular or the plural? So either Crispus and Sosthenes are the same person or the language is unclear because the word ruler is used in the singular both times. The ruler of the synagogue and beat him before the judgment seat. Gallio took no notice of such things. So they beat the guy up and he says, I don't care. Beat him up, that's your problem. Okay. Now, why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because the argument to say, well, this is how they did it in the synagogue, and that's how it should be done in the church, is an unclear argument. Because here you have the ruler of the synagogue used twice in the singular with two different people. Sosthenes, by the way, is one of the co-authors of the book of 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul and Sosthenes. Okay? Now, given that, I want to bring you to a second reason why this is a bad argument. It's really dangerous to say the, they did it this way in the intertestamental period. What's the intertestamental period? Between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The synagogue was developed. Did you know that? Did you know that the word synagogue is a Greek word, not a Hebrew word? It means sunagoge. That's how you say it. It means those who gather together, who come together. Soon is, is like with in Greek. Those who come with, those who come together. Now, did Jesus attend the synagogue? Sure he did. There's many examples of Jesus going to the synagogue. But my point is that that is a pretty flimsy argument to make a distinction between ruling elders and teaching elders. You want to make that distinction. You want to look for it. And you want to say, that's what they did in the synagogue. And my answer is, it's pretty unclear from Acts 18. And you shouldn't be looking at that. Intertestamental, dangerous. Yes, Phil. I agree with everything you just said, but is there another possibility that uh, Christmas, when he became a believer, was removed from the synagogue and replaced by Sosthenes? Could be, although these seem to have taken place one right after the other, pretty quickly. Hard to say because you come to a, in verse twelve when Galileo was proconsul of the Kai and the Jews were running for those of his Paul. Kind of sounds like a new time frame. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll repeat the question. Thank you, Mark. Okay, the, the, uh, Phil's point is, could these events, could be that when, when Christmas becomes a believer, that they threw him out of office, and that Sosthenes becomes the new ruler? Could be, I hadn't thought of that. Could be. But it doesn't change your argument. Yeah, the basic argument is, it's a weak, weak argument, particularly when we see all the rest we've seen about, right, overseers, our elders, our pastors, the same person, all of those others put together. And to look at this, no, I don't think it overturns it. Okay. Okay. So, any questions on that? Yes. Go ahead, Steve. You said something about ruling, ruling the elders don't like to teach. In a three office view, they don't. How come? Because it's an unbiblical view, non biblical. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because on word, I mean, on the elders supposed to teach? Yes. So where did that come from then? That's because of the three office views. Um, I'm that. glad you brought that up. Thank you very much. The difference between that and the deacon. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's, let's assume the three office view for a minute. The question is, thank you, Mark. Um, Steve says, uh, did I, didn't I say that on the three office view that, that elders don't have to teach? And the answer is yes. On the three office view, elders don't have to teach. They only have to rule, okay? Now, where did that come from? That came from the assumption that there is a difference between teaching and ruling elders. I want to say that the, the very terminology is not accurate. I'm arguing even against the terminology. I want to say that these people are all elders. 
should all have the same respect, double honor, right, okay? They should have the same respect and all need to be able to teach. Does that mean they have to be able to get up in front of a class and teach? No. You can talk one-on-one. -on -one. That's, that's a legitimate way of teaching. Or in, in the pulpit, that's a legitimate way of teaching. Not everybody has to have the same gifts in the classroom, but they do have to be able to communicate scripture and teach it. Now let's assume the three office view for just a minute that we're going to go look at, first, at Romans 12 in a minute. If you hold to the three office view, where in scripture are your biblical requirements for the, teach, for the ruling elder? Let's assume the three office view. Let's assume there's a difference between the teaching elder and the minister or the ruling elder and the teaching elder. That's in, where's your biblical requirement for the ruling elder? Give me, a, give me one verse. I can give you one. I do not allow a, a woman to teach or have authority over a man. So that says that the ruling elder has to be a male. That's the only thing I can think of. First Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, all the classic passages are teaching elder requirements. Where is the requirement for a ruling elder? Yes, Steve. Be a man of one wife. Uh, that's under the requirement there for teaching elders. Okay. He's to be monogamous, right? Mm -hmm. The Greek term, very interesting, is a one-woman man. Yeah, okay. So, okay. All of, there is no requirement for the ruling elder. So, in other words, if you hold to a three-office view, you can elect anybody you want as long as he's a male. Pretty bad. They don't like that when I say that. Let's go on. Romans chapter 12. I hope you see that what I am doing here, and there is a question that was asked two weeks ago that we need to address. I haven't yet really addressed it. I hope you see what I'm trying to do here is lift the office of what we call ruling elders. They ought not to be considered second class elders. They ought to be allowed to be moderators of session, moderators of presbyteries, moderators of general assembly slash synod. They're, they have all the rights and privileges of any other elder. Let's lift them up to what God has said about them. And let's give them the double honor that they are worthy of. Okay, Romans chapter 12. Now, in Romans chapter 12, uh, we have the wonderful passage where Paul begins in verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Does that sound familiar if you listen to anything from Ligonier about renewing of your mind? It's one of the verses, okay? And that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect with the will of God. And then he starts talking about gifts in the church. For I say that the grace given to me and to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt with each one a measure of faith. For as, he may have many member, as we have many members of one body, but are members that do not have the same function. This sure sounds a lot like 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Same author. Maybe there's some connection, huh? Okay, uh, verse uh, five. And so we, who being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And having these gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us do so with ministry. And he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Some people want to say, you see that one that says, he who leads? with diligence, that that's the ruling elder. Now, if you assume a three-office view, you might see that. If you don't assume a three-office view, you don't see it. You see my point here? It doesn't prove it. It depends what your assumption is, and then you read the verse. You see, is what I'm trying to say. It does not prove that, the, that there are people whose job in the church is to rule but not teach. That's what the ruling elder does according to to the three office view. He rules but doesn't teach. Now some of them allow ruling elders to teach and that's good. 1 Thessalonians 5.12. <clears throat> Exhortations here at the end of 1 Thessalonians. 
And we urge you, brothers, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Some people want to say, look, this is talking about the ruling elders. I think the proper answer is it's talking about the elders. Don't make this distinction between ruling and teaching. Okay. Recognize those who labor among you and are over you. Are there people over us in the church? Yes, there are. There are elders. There are shepherds. Okay. They're over you, the Lord, and admonish you. Okay. Okay. To esteem them very highly. Those are the typical verses that are used to prove the three office view. I hope you're convinced that none of them prove the three office view. Any questions? Yes, Chris. So I think that uh, the Bill's distinction is, I think it makes sense here, because as you said, these, these are not very clear in these verses. So I think, I mean, the idea of non-biblical verses uh, against the Bible, I think is an important distinction here. I think it's not, there are verses, like you said, you can look at these and you, choose, you, you, you kind of come to one side or the other, depending upon what you're, free, uh, you're, you're coming into. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think that's an important distinction here. Um, like, for instance, you could actually say that Titus and, and, um, and Timothy letters, the, the instructions that are given to Titus and Timothy might be that for the ruling elder. So there, there's different things you can come at from different sides, and I'm not trying to argue one side or the other. But, but I think that this, it, that's why I think it's, it's definitely good to discuss, but it doesn't seem to be like there's a really clear case either way. In my okay. So Chris's point is um, the issue to bring up is a good issue. Let us look at it. And you appreciate that distinction that Phil is trying to make. And that helps us keep things in the level of, of, um, of priorities and importance. Right? We're not talking about the Trinity here. We're not talking about justification by faith alone and those kinds of foundational issues. We're talking about issues even among Presbyterians where they disagree with each other but work together. Okay. It, was there more to it than that? No, I'm, I'm trying to repeat your question. Yes, Mary. My question is if, if the elders are all one, where is there the distinction that you have to be approved before you exhort? Or? Yeah, okay, good. Um, and that brings you to a point that I did want to address. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mark. <laughs> Mary's point is, wh where do you get the point where they have to be approved before they can exhort? Okay. Um, I think that the answer to that question is, um, there are requirements. I think the, the requirements of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 apply to elders. Elders. You know, I'm, I'm rejecting this distinction. And that um, part of that idea of being an elder is the, the ability to exhort. That's in Titus 1 especially, okay? That they may be able to exhort those um, who, um, the word's not confound, but who have hold, um, hold false doctrine. I think you had a little more nuance though to your question. Ah, very good. So, in other words, should we make the requirements for our congregational elders okay, be the same as the requirements for our ministers? Because, yeah, if it's the same office, because today in our culture, the requirements for the minister, which is a basic three office assumption, are much higher. Typically, uh, has to be a college graduate, has to be a seminary graduate, uh, has exams in uh, Greek, Hebrew, uh, English Bible, systematic theology, apologetics, church history, those kinds of things, which typically for our congregational ruling elders slash, we don't have those kind of requirements. Now, th there may be exams, but they're not as rigorous. And your question is, should they be as rigorous? Yeah. Who wants to address that? <laughs> have you noticed how I'm being a weasel? <laughs> I think the answer is, given the world that we live in, that no, but we ought to raise the office. I think something that we ought to be doing all the time is continuing 
education for all of our elders, ruling and teaching elders. And I mean that we ought to bring in speakers for a sessional once a year, twice a year, whatever, um, retreats or advances, you know, but we have a time where we bring in specialists to teach us scripture and theology, church history, whatever. Sure, we got a, we got a seminary really close that we can bring guys in and pay them to set up a design a course for our elders. Other people too, but especially the elders, right? So sure, I think a valuable thing that we don't do enough of is church history. Church history is basically the history of doctrine. And you learn a lot of doctrine by discussing history. So yeah, we ought to raise those requirements. But until we do. Until we do. Sure, why not? Now, I don't know, I, I'm sorry, I'm reading the ARP, I'm trying to get better at it. I don't know if the ARP loves it. The OPC would allow that, where my background is. Okay, but again, the term, like you correctly say, would be exhorting. The question is, would it be okay for a ruling elder to exhort from the pulpit as part of the worship service if our pastors weren't here? I think it would be, um, and uh, it should be, uh, um, there are some churches, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. There are some other continental churches. Y'all remember what continental church means? Those, okay. They have such a strong three office view that if a minister is not present, an elder may not exhort. All he can do is read a sermon of another minister. So they'll typically read a Spurgeon sermon, you know, or something like that. Okay, they'll, they'll read that. Because he may not give his own exhortation. May not. He's not allowed. Now, I disagree with that, of course. Okay, but that's the form of government that some churches have. So therefore, he has to read the sermon of a minister. There's a lot of sermons out there that you can get copies of. Yes, Robert. First of all, the session wants to give their extreme thanks to Chad for being here. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not a topic that comes up really at all. But I did want to pass on, and there might be two or three still here. We have had an elder in the past that didn't preach. Uh, that person's not here anymore. But I believe that the kind of rules of engagement, I think that person submitted their sermon ahead of time as well. Which is a good and practice to do. And it was more of just a peer review kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So there was a check and balance involved. Um, so, so we have. It's been a long time, but we have. Okay. Yeah, they're not allowed to administer the sacraments. They're not allowed to pronounce the benediction. There are certain things they're allowed to do and not allowed to do. Right. Okay. So the, the Robert's point is, in the past here at Faith, uh, ruling elders have exhorted their own sermon, but they passed it by the pastors ahead of time. Kind of a peer review thing. Okay. Mary, did you have another question? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Any more about our excursus? We're, uh, okay, we're still on our excursus with First Timothy five. Yes, Robert. Well, you know, we just we have this hyper anti-intellectualism going on right now too, and uh, to me, the three office view just completely disincentivizes a ruling elder to continue to grow anyway. Yeah. You know, and I, and I, I'm really glad you said that, and let me tell you why. Robert's point is we have. In our current state of affairs in our culture is, is anti-intellectualism is taking over. And one of the implications, if you make this strong distinction where the minister is the educated one, is it disincentivizes the ruling elder to, to grow. Now, I just this week read a very interesting article in an OPC journal uh, talking about the effects of egalitarianism. You all know egalitarianism, everything is equal egalitarianism in our society and the anti-intellectualism of it. And one of the results of that stuff is the two office view. That's what the person was arguing in this. And I was gonna reproduce it, but it's really a long article, okay? okay. Now, I, I submit to you that, see, Robert, you, looking at the same situation, came to the opposite conclusion that this article did. Okay, because the, art, the article was arguing for the three office view and that egalitarianism has done away with this distinction. Okay, now 
I th personally think anti-intellectualism is not a good thing. Okay? I think education can be extraordinarily helpful. One of the best things I got out of my education was my bad ideas were chopped off. Okay? Because you talk about them in class and other people correct you, hopefully politely, and you, and you learn to think better because your, your ways of thinking are corrected and fine-tuned in classes. That's, that's one of the advantages of the traditional classroom environment, is your thinking is, is fine-tuned. Okay. okay, any more? Yes, Robert. Yeah, I apologize. One more. Just that's fine. Comment. Don't apologize. That's I good. think a, a bigger topic here, too, is it really puts the burden on the congregation to, uh, and, and, you know, when, they, when they make these elections, they have to make decisions yes yeah robert's point is the concept in the first one that officers are elected by the people puts a burden on the people of god to be serious and take it serious and to <coughs> the vet was the term you used to analyze the people that are running for office to be able to make sure we're putting godly people in those offices yes very much so yeah yeah any other okay let's go to um page eight up at the top. Fifth principle, the Jerusalem Council. <coughs> now, this is extraordinarily important if you want to be protected. Now, maybe you don't want to be protected. I want to be protected. Okay? So let's go to Acts 15. Now, we need to we need to get our geography squared away. Not squared away, uh, remind it just a little bit. Okay. This is the Mediterranean. <laughs> you, you saw that? Thank you, Kathy. Kathy saw this is the Mediterranean. <laughs> you guys got Jonah from Kathy from Bible school, right? You got Jonah on the mind. <laughs> is this Cyprus or Crete? And this is very good. Okay. Over here we have Palestine, Israel. Okay, over here is Jerusalem. Okay, over here. Over here is a city called Antioch. Antioch. You remember this area is Syria, right? So this is called Syrian Antioch because over here was another Antioch in the area called Pisidia. Okay, and you remember that Paul, on his first missionary journey, the church sent him, he goes over here, preaches the gospel, and then goes up here and preaches and then reverses himself and comes back. Okay, so we have to keep our Antiochs clear. Okay. So in Acts 15, there's an issue that arises in Syrian Antioch. Now, this area up here is called what? Galatia. Is there a bi book in the Bible written to the churches, plural, of Galatia? Yes, there is. Some people think that the book, the letter to the Galatians, is written after the Acts 15 Jerusalem Council. Okay? Because what Paul does afterwards is he goes up here and takes the message to the churches, gets the Macedonian call, and goes up here then into Europe. Okay, the second missionary journey. Okay. So it's important for us to remember. So there's an, there's an issue here in Antioch. And what they do is they say, let's go talk to the, the elders and the apostles in Jerusalem. And they have a council in Jerusalem. And the council debates the issue and makes a decision. So let's now take a look at that. Okay. Acts 15, verse 1. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the, the brethren. So they come from Judea and they go to Antioch. Why does it say they came down when they went north? Have you noticed that? Yeah, you always go up to Jerusalem and down from Jerusalem, no matter what direction you're going. If you go up in elevation, you're still going down from Jerusalem. 
Okay? Okay, so is the, okay? So, so certain men came down from Judea and taught the brothers, quote, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So you see what the issue is? Justification by faith alone or justification by faith plus works. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem. Remember, you're going up to Jerusalem. To the apostles and elders about this question. And being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to the brothers. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, so there were some Pharisees that were saved, rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So the Pharisees who had been saved are saying this. It is necessary. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when they had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should, bear, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And so God, or so God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. What is Peter referring to? Cornelius, right? The whole incident with Cornelius in Acts 10. Preaches the gospel, okay? They get saved, they speak with tongues, they're a sign that they are saved. That's what he's referring to. God made no distinction. Verse 10, now therefore, why do you test God strong language, by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Why are you putting a yoke on these brothers? <coughs> but we believe that through the, <clears throat> through the grace of the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. So you see Peter's argument. We're saved the same way they are. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. So now we, first we had Peter, the big dispute, Pharisees talking about, Peter talks, okay. Then they listened to Barnabas and Paul, okay, and now James. Saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up that the rest of mankind may, hear the, may seek the Lord. For all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Just about time. Known to God from eternity, are all, from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but they will write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has from throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogue every Sabbath. Well, I want you to finish this up. So here's your homework. Finish reading Acts 15. <clears throat> Read the notes there. And you'll notice that one of the questions here is, do you agree with Witherow's argument and details? So Witherow here on page 32 has the fifth principle. He's dealing with Acts 15. Okay. So this passage is used by Presbyterians, I agree with this, that says you have a right to appeal to the broader church. The broader church. If we have prelacy as our model,
you don't go broader and broader as you move up, right? Priests, you know, bishops, cardinals, pope, you go, you go more and more narrow, less and less people. The Presbyterian model, you remember the concentric circles, you have the session, you have the presbytery, you have the synod or the general assembly. You see how it's getting broader and broader, bigger and bigger. In a sense, the pyramid is flipped upside down. So it's proper in the Presbyterian language to, appeal, to use the language, I appeal to the broader church. That's what they did there in Acts 15. They appealed to the broader church. Okay. So this is the passage that's used. Now, uh, used to prove your right to appeal. Now, read Witherow. I think Witherow is quite good as he analyzes this. So it's only about three, four pages long. So read that uh, and answer the questions that are there. <coughs> uh, I submit to you just for your, and we'll talk about it next week. There are churches within the Reformed world where you don't have this. I'm not talking about our brothers that have a congregational. I'm talking about our brothers that have a quasi-Presbyterian government. Okay? I'm talking about the URC in particular. Okay? The URC, you don't have, this, you don't have the right that Witherow talks about. Okay? And we'll develop that next week. You know, good, solid brothers in the URC, but this is one area where I disagree with them. Okay? So we'll look at that historically. Any other questions? You got your homework squared away? Okay. Okay, good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We praise you for the government you have given us. We ask, Lord, that you would give us wisdom as we deal with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's one more thing for you to read. This is another document. Remember you had the Council of Trent? This is called the Prolactical Petition. Isn't that a wonderful name? The prolactical petition. This is an argument for prelacy from within the Church of England. Okay? So, again, read this this week. We'll talk about this prolactical petition. So, I'll hand these, I'll get these over there. You can read, read that this week. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son,